You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 238. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Welcome, welcome, veggie lovers, to another fabulous episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Today, we will be talking with Dr. Bill Rawls about herbs, but also about lifestyle medicine and a lot of interesting things. So before I tell you more about him, I do want to tell you it's very exciting that they are going to be giving away three books three to three random winners and his book is called the cellular wellness solution it's a great book it's kind of like an herbal slash lifestyle medicine encyclopedia so i really recommend it in order to be in the drawing to be one of the winners that we choose you must message me on my instagram at the dr yami So that's at the Dr. Yami, message me with the keyword herbs, H-E-R-B-S. And the deadline is January 31st, 2023. If you want to be entered into the drawing to be one of the three winners of the book, The Cellular Wellness Solution by Dr. Bill Rawls, at my Instagram, at the Dr. Yami, deadline January 31st, 2023. So I hope that you will message me and that you are one of the winners. So this episode, we talk about herbs and I wanted to throw in that one of my listeners did message me on Instagram a while back. This is Kristen K. They said, hi, I'm a huge fan of your podcast and want to say thank you for making this information so fun and accessible. I'm a parent of two kids under seven and an aspiring plant-based family. You recently asked about podcast requests and I would love if you could share about herbal teas and herbalism in general. There are so many claims out there and I'm wondering what kind of science there is safety and where you think this fits into health, especially for kids. Thinking hibiscus, lemon balm, nettle, rose hips, mint, chamomile, red clover, alfalfa, oat straw, question mark. All seem pretty mild from what I've read but I really trust your judgment and would love to hear your perspective on drinking these things daily. Okay, so I am definitely not an expert on herbs or herbalism. So that is why I have this expert on the show. And I think the timing was great. Kristen K, it sounds like you don't need to worry about the safety of these common herbal teas. And Dr. Bill Ross feels that for children, that it's not a problem. But listen to the episode so that you can learn more about it for sure. So let me talk to you about Bill Rawls. Dr. Bill Rawls, for over 30 years, has been a fourth generation physician and he has dedicated his life to medicine. When a health crisis in his early 40s abruptly changed his quality of life, he came face to face with the limitations of modern medicine and began to research the vast possibilities of alternative treatments. Today, Dr. Rawls shares the revelations that helped himself and thousands of others reclaim their lives and find their own paths to wellness. He is the best-selling author of Unlocking Lyme, The Cellular Wellness Solution, and is the medical director and co-founder of Vital Plan Inc., a holistic health company and certified B Corporation. So in this episode, we talk about the health crisis that changed the trajectory of his career. We talk about the stealth microbiome and how we protect ourselves from it, the five obstacles to wellness, how we set ourselves up for optimum health with diet and lifestyle choices, why herbs are so powerful, what are some common misconceptions about herbs, and if we should all be consuming herbs regularly, if so, which ones. 
if herbs can be potentially harmful. What about pregnancy and lactation? We hear a lot about things that could be potentially harmful or unsafe. How do we figure out what could be safe and what can be taken during pregnancy and lactation? Even talk about intermittent fasting. So it is a really great episode, lots to learn. And like I said, I really, enjoyed this book. It is a book that will stay on my bookshelf that I will refer to because I do want to start incorporating herbs into my regimen for overall well-being, longevity, probably also to support good sleep because now that I'm in my 40s, I find that staying asleep consistently isn't always there. So I'm going to use them for that. And yeah, I'm excited to experiment and see how it contributes to my wellness and my well-being. So this is a great episode. I hope that you love it. Thank you so much for being here week after week and welcome if this is your first time. Now let's welcome Dr. Bill Rawls. Dr. Bill Rawls, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. It's such a pleasure to have you today. No, oh, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. So you wrote a fantastic book, The Cellular <laughs> Wellness Solution. I actually was very impressed with this book. It is evidence-based, but it's also really well balanced between allopathic medicine and herbal medicine and taking approaches from both sides and synthesizing them in one book. So congratulations on writing this book. Well, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, sounds like I've achieved my goal. And you know, <laughs> it, it was it was a job. It took two years, over two years to research the book, but then another year just to make it readable to everybody, yeah. to take all that congested information and put it in a form that people could actually use it. And that's the, the beauty of having editors that help us do things like that. But I could tell that you put a lot of thought and work into it. So I'm grateful that you wrote it. But let's start at the beginning of what even prompted this. Tell me about the health crisis that changed the trajectory of your career. Sure. Yeah. You know, we, we all have a story. I mean, those of us who are doing something a bit different, there's generally a reason why. So I went to medical school, uh, conventionally trained, um, went into obstetrics and gynecology because I was attracted to the wellness aspect of that specialty. You know, most of the patients were young. It was very vital. Uh, bringing the life into the world was just really extraordinary. But in a small town, practicing in a small town, I was obligated to take night call every second to third night. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that if I had somebody in labor or somebody in the hospital or something going on, I just didn't sleep. Um, back in the 80s and the 90s, there was this idea that, yeah, why do people really need to sleep, you know? And so I was pushing four to six hours of sleep every night for 20 years. And I eventually just crashed, but it wasn't like I just needed to sleep and I just got so that I just slept all the time, I lost my ability to sleep and my body started breaking down. I started developing heart issues, brain issues, joint issues, gut issues, everything. My whole body was falling apart and my medical colleagues just really had no understanding of what was going on. You know, most of the tests were relatively normal. So I was one of those people that got left without a diagnosis that ended up identifying with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. Later discovered I was carrying some of the microbes associated with Lyme disease. And it was like, finally, okay, you know, now I've got a diagnosis we can treat. Uh, tried round after round of antibiotics and it just made me sicker. And now I really understand chronic Lyme disease very differently than most people do. And I, you know, it, it's part of a bigger picture of understanding chronic illness. Um, but long story short, it led me to an herbal protocol that I was uh, really uh, didn't have high expectations in the beginning, but was desperate and embraced herbs um, and got my life back. And, you know, that wasn't suddenly. It was, I noticed a difference over several months. 
but it took like three to five years before I had a complete restoration of my health. But even then, you know, my, my health wasn't what I would call perfect. It was just what I considered recovered. And so I kept working on my diet, health, lifestyle. I had given up uh, taking obstetrics and, you know, gravitated more toward a practice that was more like what we would define as a functional medicine practice today. Um, but I really, really st worked on studying the herbs and I've spent, you know, uh, almost two decades now really understanding what the herbs were doing. But so I continued refining my use of herbs and now that's been, you know, a good 15 years have passed. I'm 65. My health is better than average for people my age. Not only did I recover from everything that I was suffering from, I got everything back and then some. You know, I was diagnosed with essential hypertension when I was in my 30s. My blood pressure is normal now, no medications. My cholesterol is normal. My blood sugar is normal. I mean, everything normalized. So yeah, I take my regimen of herbs every day. I'm picky about what I eat and how I go about life and definitely whether I get a good night's sleep or not. But I am not aging the same way that other people are. And that's pretty exciting. Such an incredible journey. And you had to have so much patience and so much willingness to try different things and wait for the effects. I mean, it's really incredible to read your story. Yeah, it, it, I was my own guinea pig and to a certain extent still am not doing crazy things like odd drugs or experimental therapies, just trying different herbs and combinations of herbs and really looking at it and going, how can we tweak this thing to make it better? And so that was just, you know, that was an ongoing process that uh, absorbed my life. But, you know, along the way, I mean, early on, there was a lot of anger. Like, why is this happening to me? You know, why, why, what, what, what have I done to deserve all this? But along the way, I shifted to this idea of, okay, what are you trying to teach me here? I'm paying attention now. Show me. And so everything I learned, I fed back into my practice and toured patients and developed this passion for writing, um, not only books, but, you know, just creating content to convey these ideas because I was coming up you know, with a very, very different way of looking at wellness and chronic illness than either my conventional colleagues or really anybody else out there. And I wanted to share that because, you know, as I started looking for the science to support these ideas, it was all there. And, you know, so this is very evidence based. The evidence is out there. The problem is our, our, our medical community isn't paying attention to a lot of really important evidence because it doesn't necessarily support drug therapy as the, as the answer. Yeah. And as a physician, I'll say myself, it's just not, I mean, I subscribe to medical news. I try, try to keep on, on top of all the latest guidelines and all the changes. Nothing ever comes up about herbs ever, ever. <laughs> so it's not like it's something, it's not part of our culture in the medical community to even look at what we call quote alternative therapy. Right. And even then right. I think physicians were trained to be skeptical about that, which is really ironic because medications have to come from somewhere too, right? And a lot of medications, the origins are plants <laughs> at some point, you know? So it is a little bit interesting. But that, tell that, me about- there, Well, there's where, I have, there's where I have a surprise for you. Yes, a lot of our drugs, up to 70% of our drugs have origins in plants, but guess what? they came from plants that we defined as poisons, the vast majority of them. So what we define as herbs that we use on a daily basis are very different from the plants that ended up being the origins of most of our drugs. So long-term, you know, even way back, physicians have been using herbs, but 
really potent herbs that had these very targeted and drug-like effects which is not what I'm using. I'm using herbs that are, are that, you know, the, the big difference is herbs block the processes of illness, block the manifestations, symptoms, et cetera. Um, the herbs are actually promoting healing and those things are very, very different. So the herbs that I'm talking about um, and that I use on a daily basis really don't have any drug-like effects. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I love that you were able to make a distinction because that is very important. And I definitely want to get to that. But before we get to that, tell me about the stealth microbiome. What does that mean and how do we protect ourselves from it? Yeah, um, that's that's where I, you know, that's that's a place that I went with this understanding of chronic Lyme disease that wasn't expected. Um, you know, so we define chronic, uh, chronic, we define Lyme disease as an infection with a bacteria called Borrelia that is carried by ticks. And so, you know, when you get acutely infected by, by that bacteria, um, it can cause symptoms, but typically it just stays dormant inside your body. Um, that's a really interesting factor that, uh, you know, you hear a lot about Lyme disease, but acute Lyme disease isn't that common. What is very common is people get bitten by a tick. The microbe, the bacteria, uh, enters their system and becomes dormant in their tissues and they don't know about it. You know, I picked these bacteria up when I was a child. But when you talk to people with chronic Lyme disease and they're tested, they found that they have a range of other bacteria and viruses you know, they have Bartonella, Babesia, Rickettsia, but they also have found to have reactivation of bacteria that didn't necessarily come from ticks like Chlamydia and Mycoplasma. And they have reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus and all these other things. So as I started digging, I found that this is really common, that we pretty much everything we pick up through our lifetimes um, can become dormant in our tissues. Even after the symptoms of the infection are gone, these microbes can be still present um, in, inside of our cells, in our brain, in our heart, in our joints, throughout our body. And that is really fascinating. But even more than that, you know, we consider our gut microbes and our skin microbes to be separate from us. You know, they're contained inside the gut or outside on the skin. And it turns out that things are constantly trickling from our gut, from our skin, from our sinuses, from our gums into our bloodstream, and they make their way to our tissues. And the research is showing that we actually have a microbiome of the brain of just hundreds of species of bacteria that live in our brain. And if our, our body is healthy, more importantly, if our cells are healthy, these things can stay dormant and never give us any issues. But if you don't take care of yourself, more specifically, you don't take care of your cells. You're eating bad food. You live in a toxic environment. You're stressed. You don't get sleep. You don't exercise like you should. These bacteria, viruses, protozoa start reactivating and they start breaking down cells. And that's what illness is all about. And we have a lot of different illnesses because we all pick up a different spectrum of microbes as we go through life. So scientists are starting to call this the dormant blood and tissue microbiome, this idea that we actually have dormant bacteria, viruses, protozoa inside cells throughout our body and actually in our bloodstream, in our red blood cells, in our white blood cells. And as long as we're healthy, as long as we have good health habits, then these things can stay dormant and never give us problems. But don't do that. And especially with the aging process, your body shifts from an environment that favors cellular health to one that favors microbe growth. And that's, of course, not a good thing. Oh, that's so scary. It feels like having a ticking time bomb inside of your body that you have to be aware that's it there. Is. So trying to do everything you can to 
promote a state of being that fosters them staying asleep and not bothering you. But that totally makes sense when we think about autoimmune disease and you know autoimmune disease always been this kind of weird like oh it could be triggered by this and this and this but if everybody has this stealth microbiome in there it makes sense that changes in our life you know the increased stress not enough sleep eating a lot of ultra processed foods you know doing those things big uh, impacts into our bodies even big physical stress to our bodies can trigger a release of those microbes that can trigger autoimmune disease and other conditions. It's true. You know, you think about it. I mean, think about maybe your joint tissues and inside your joint tissues, you have dormant bacteria, you know, and, and people would ask, well, you know, how, how is it that we could, how could they be dormant? Our cells are much bigger than bacteria. So a, a bacteria is about a thousand times smaller than one of our cells. So you can have a little collection of bacteria inside your cells. And if they're walled off and dormant, your cells can still keep functioning. So imagine that you've got that in your joints, but you have really bad health issues and you strain one of those joints and the cells get damaged and they reactivate and start uh, start uh, breaking down and infecting other cells, the body's recourse is it makes antibodies to the bacteria, but it also makes antibodies to the cells that have been infected and normal cells surrounding it. So I don't think you can explain autoimmune illness without considering that variable. Yeah, so interesting. Well, you know, reading your book, I realized that you are a true lifestyle medicine physician as well, whether you know it or not, hopefully you do know it. Oh, yeah. And I would love to talk to you about what you think are the five obstacles to wellness that you've outlined in your book. Sure. You know, that, that especially bringing it down to a cellular level, you know, we, we think about the body as a whole, but it's really made up of cells. And so... What we're talking about, about our health, is the health of the individual cells that make up our body. So when we look at illness and symptoms, you know, we're doing it in that big picture look, almost like we're trying to, you know, repair a car. But our body's different. It's not like a, a, a car. It's made up of all these individual cells. So it's, it's cellular health that's most important what symptoms are or when cells in the body are stressed. So no matter what your symptom, you can relate it to cellular stress. Like if you block off a coronary artery, then cells in the heart, your heart muscle cells don't get oxygen and nutrients and they start to starve and they start becoming stressed. When that happens, cells release substances that activate nerves that tell the brain something is going on. Um, so we feel it as pain, but those cells, we also lose that function. So part of a symptom is feeling the symptom, but also losing the function of the symptom. So what healing is, is the ability of cells in the body to regenerate and repair. So, you know, we have symptoms that kind of come and go during our lifetime, and it's because our cells are always trying to recover. So when you have chronic symptoms or chronic illness, it means that there are ongoing stresses that are preventing those cells from recovering like they should. So no matter what your complex of symptoms, no matter what the illness, it's all about chronic cellular stress. So when you look at that, instead of asking, well, how do we block the symptoms and block the manifestations of illness with drugs, which can be really complicated, and that, you know, I, and I'm not knocking that. I mean, you know, acute medical intervention is really important, especially in acute stages of any illness but it doesn't really promote healing. To promote healing, to allow cells to recover, you have to address the stress factors. So when you look at the underlying stress that, that, that drives any chronic illness, you can always come back to five primary factors. Um, so the big one is nutrition. Um, most of us really are eating a poor diet. We're eating a grain and meat-based diet that's high in carbohydrates and fats that our cells are really not designed to tolerate. 
So that's a huge factor that stressing ourselves or, or setting up chronic stress that sets us up for those bad situations. We live in a world that's saturated with, with uh, unnatural toxins. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of different chemicals that have been released into the environment uh, over the past hundred years, and we keep adding to it. And so much of it is related to use of petroleum and coal. So toxic environment, um, and that includes the, all the toxic radiation that we're exposed to. Uh, chronic stress, um, you know, we're all, we all have schedules and deadlines and we've got to be where we need to be and we're just all running at a, at a breakneck pace all the time. And then at night when we should be shutting things down, we're watching stimulating television till 11 o'clock at night and we're not sleeping like we should. Average America uh, gets about six and a half hours of sleep. Sleep is essential for cellular downtime. Our cells need downtime to recover. And if you're not sleeping, that's not happening. And exercise. Exercise is number four on the list. Um, and trauma. You know, I put physical factors all together. So trauma actually, you know, that does acute damage to cells. But, um, but being sedentary is just as bad because our cells need to be flushed with fluid all the time to wash, to, to bring in nutrients and wash away uh, toxic substances. So when we exercise, when we move, when we're physically active, we increase blood flow. And then finally, that microbe factor that we talk about, and we all pick up a different spectrum of microbes, some worse than others which gives us, so I think our risk of different chronic illnesses is more related to the microbes that we're exposed to than our genetics. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, that process starts early because I recently found a study that the placenta actually has a microbiome, amniotic fluid has a microbiome, and well before a baby is born, during the pregnancy, the mother is actually passing her microbiome along to her infant. So if she's eating bad food and stressed and all of these things and, and has, has cultivated uh, an unfavorable balance of bacteria, she's fast passing that to her baby early on. Wow, it's incredible. Yeah, we're learning so much more every day about the microbiome and all of these influences that we have prenatally, but even back to our grandmothers and great grandmothers. So there's a, yeah, a lot to be said true. for our habits and, you know, starting healthy habits, not just for ourselves, but passing it through uh, down to the generation. So Okay, so that being said, the obstacles that we have, how can we set ourselves up for optimum health through our diet and lifestyle choices? Yeah, that's um, yeah. We, we 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 started talking about herbs. That's a big one. But before we get there, it's it's going down those five categories. So, uh, what I consider an optimal diet, the guidelines that I go by are eating more vegetables than anything else. That's the hard one. I have such a hard time getting people to eat vegetables, but you should be eating more vegetables than anything. But it's like I had a smoothie this morning to start my day and it had some blueberries and some mushroom powders and collagen and all that, but it also had celery and cucumbers and salad greens. And it was pretty good and it was half vegetables. And so I shoot for that virtually every meal. Um, carbs, carbs are killers. I try to keep my carbohydrate count less than 150 grams a day. Now that's not ketogenic. I think our brain does run better with a little bit of glucose, but you know, you, but it, and, and that's comfortable. You know, that means you can have a little sugar in your tea or whatever. Um, but it, if you're watching that, if you're staying under that count, your cells are burning that, you know, that's enough that just normal daily activity, you're burning it. And then narrowing the eating window down to about six or eight hours to give your body time to recover. Um, Second level, that toxic environment, just being smarter about things, um, you know, ch making sure your indoor air is clean by the types of cleaners that you use and changing your filters. Um, ideally, living in an area with clean air, 
um, getting out to places, outdoor places where the air is clean to go hiking and biking and, and uh, filtering your water, eating uh, clean, preferably organic food whenever it's practical. So, you know, there's some ways you can get around that. Skin products, natural skin products instead of petroleum based. Um, most, most skin products off the counter are petroleum based. They have un unnatural chemicals in them. So pay a little extra, go with the natural stuff. Um, stress, it's just balancing that daily lifestyle. So you're getting downtime during the day. You're starting to shut things down in the evening so you could get a good night's sleep. And that can be balanced by being physically active. I try to walk the equivalent, um, you know, my minimum is the equivalent of three miles every day or about 10,000 steps. Um, and uh, I've gotten so I wear one of these Fitbit monitors just uh, really to keep me up on that, to give me feedback on my sleep. I'm pretty attuned, but I found that it is valuable. And for somebody just starting out, that can really be really helpful. And then the, the, the microbes, you know, just being smart about things is, is, is good. But the herbs give you an extra edge. So all herbs, all plants have antimicrobial properties, but it's not like an antibiotic. So when we take an herb, we're basically taking the defense system of the plant. So plants are creating uh, chemical defense systems to protect the plant cells against free radicals, toxic substances, and microbes of every variety. Different plants have different stress factors to, in their natural environment. So, you know, you take herbs from different places and you get this synergy of things that are blended together to really give you this wonderful effect. So typically most herbal formulas are five or more herbs because we want to get that synergy, that, that balance. So the herbs are working by protecting ourselves against free radicals, against toxic substances, um, even against uh, excessive carbohydrates, uh, against microbes. So the herbs are doing that in a variety of different ways, and they're giving you an extra edge that you really can't get from diet and lifestyle. And now for a very important message. Hey mama, if you are feeling frustrated about mealtime battles, worried that your child isn't eating enough or eating enough vegetables, afraid that your child is going to get some awful deficiency or disease because of the lack of diversity in their diet, I wrote a book that might be for you. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Did you know that most children are born with the innate ability to eat the appropriate amount of food to satisfy their hunger and support appropriate growth? Despite this, parents are still anxious and confused about how much and what to feed their children. In addition, many children are labeled as picky eaters or develop behaviors such as hiding and sneaking food. There's also a growing epidemic of dieting behaviors and eating disorders beginning at alarmingly young ages. In my book, you'll learn the five pillars of healthy eating, how to apply intuitive eating through all the stages of development, lifestyle habits that support healthy eating and body image, troubleshooting and problem solving for picky eaters, overeating and dieting behaviors, how to create and foster a healthy body image in your children, how exploring your own body image and relationship with food will help raise an intuitive eater, and what foods to offer your child at different stages of development. A Parent's Guide to Intuitive Eating, How to Raise Kids Who Love to Eat Healthy, available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook through all major online booksellers. Are you ready for a fresh approach to feeding your child? For more information, visit dryami.com forward slash book. And now back to the episode. Very interesting, very fascinating. Has it been difficult to learn about herbs and apply them to your health and your patient's treatment plans? I know 
you said the journey's been a long time, but once you started looking into it, was it difficult to find the information? Um, it's been pieces of information all along the way. So, you know, I had this extraordinary occurrence with herbs that I got my life back. And at that time I thought, well, I'm, I'm just killing the Lyme microbes, you know, and that's what it's all about. But I came to appreciate that you don't necessarily eradicate what you've got. You know, you're not going to clear everything from your system, but you want to put things back in a dormant state so that your cells are healthy and your body is healthy. And so in the beginning, you know, this fascination led me to explore the, tr the herbal traditions, traditional, herbal, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, the Ayurvedic medicine. I mean, I read it all. I studied uh, herbs from Amazon and herbal traditions and North America and Europe. Uh, I tried to consume everything in the world. And there are a lot of similarities because what I also found is there are plants all over the world that have similar properties. So what we were doing with the herbal traditions is, is what we call observational medicine, that we basically observe symptoms in an individual and it's in, you know, and tradition says, well, these herbs uh, might help with that person's symptoms and help them to become well. But most of all of our herbal traditions predate science. So we really had, they didn't understand what was going on in a cellular or biochemical level. That's what makes me tick. I mean, I was a chemistry major. I've always been fascinated about how the chemistry of the body works. Um, so over time, I, you know, I, I needed more information than just the traditions. I wanted to know why those things were the way that they were. Um, so I started, you know, looking for that information. And fortunately, since the internet um, over the past two decades, there has just been an explosion of information, of research worldwide on herbs, the the chemical complex of the herbs that we call the phytochemistry and how that influences uh, uh, our physiology um, when we take herbs. So we actually know more about herbs than we ever have. And possibly we even know more about how herbs work than a lot of drugs work. So there are a lot of things we still don't know about how many drugs work. You know, if, if you look at the, uh, the uh, information on most herbs, uh, they'll give you a, a rough idea of what they think is happening, but the bottom line, they go, mechanism of action unknown. <laughs> and so, so we actually know a lot about herbs. We know how these chemicals affect microbes and free radicals and all of these things. And um, so when I'm looking at herbs and how they work, I like that Western science approach of actually understanding what the chemistry of the plant is doing and how different herbs are different. So some plants are going to have chemicals that are uh, have more drug-like effects or potentially even poisons. So there's a wide range of plants, but the plants we define as the herbs that I use on a daily basis are things that humans have been using for hundreds or even thousands of years to protect health and promote wellness. And I think that's the big difference. You know, drugs are really good for treating the manifestations of illness where herbs are really good for promoting or helping someone cultivate wellness. Yeah, that's a very important difference. What are some common misconceptions about herbs? Yeah, I think the big one is people look to herbs to do the same thing that a drug is doing, but without side effects. You know, I mean, sleep is the big one. You know, what everybody wants with a is is uh, an herbal combination that will give them a perfect night's sleep uh, every single time they use it, not have any drug-like effects, not have, have habituation or a morning hangover. And, you know, it's just there, there's nothing in nature that's as potent as what people are looking for. 
Um, so, but there are some, you know, calming properties of different herbs. So I think everybody is looking to them to treat a symptom like they would be treating a, uh, using a drug, but they get frustrated because, you know, a lot of times the symptom doesn't go away immediately. And that was my case, you know, it was weeks or even months before I started, uh, noticing a difference. So, so drugs work very fast and herbs that have drug-like properties work very fast because they are blocking specific pathways or blocking our, our perception of a symptom. So we feel that pretty fast. So what the herbs are doing, the herbs that I'm using um, and referring to, what they're doing is blocking factors that would cause cellular stress. So it, it basically allows our cells you know, it de-stresses our cells and allows them to recover from being stressed, rebuild the internal functions, regenerate new cells. Well, that takes time. And some cells, it takes a long time. It's like we turn over skin cells and intestinal cells on a daily basis, but our heart cells, our muscle cells, our brain cells, you know, that's, that's a lot different. It takes a lot longer for those, for those cells to recover. So herb is a, the herbs are more of a long-term commitment, even a lifetime commitment. And it's, it's, it's enhancing cellular resilience, the ability of cells to recover, um, which is really what wellness is all about. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. So I never thought about it that way, but I love how you explain that because it's true. I think, especially in the United States, we're all looking for that magic bullet or that quick fix. But really what you're saying is that when we're using herbs, especially along with all of these different principles of lifestyle medicine, what right. we're doing is that we're allowing the body, the time to heal itself. We're allowing ourselves that space, that ability to repair themselves. And that takes time and patience. That's what it's all about. Yeah. But it's, yeah. but it's so powerful. It is so powerful. Yeah. You know, I mean, if every person was taking advantage of that right now, I think we would see a dramatic reduction in chronic illness. And we're talking about, Hey, look at it. 60%, but according to the CDC, 60% of the American population is defined as struggling with a chronic illness. 60%. I mean, that's crazy. It, it shouldn't be that way. And, and, it's, and, it, and the way around it is so easy. Yes. Yeah, but it does, it does take time. And just like you've discovered in your own journey, trial and error and what works best for every individual. But I think for me, what it comes down to is that desire to just feel good, you know? And I think you mentioned that in your book as well, that when it comes down to the end of the day, we want to be able to hang out with the people we love and do the activities we want to do without being in pain, without feeling like we're limited by chronic conditions. And if we have the ability to start doing that today right. with some of these habits and behaviors and with using some herbs that might support our cellular healing, that's such a gift. So speaking of, should we all be consuming herbs regularly? <laughs> Loaded question. And if so, which ones? Uh, absolutely. Yep. I mean, you know, that is my mission. You know, everybody out there takes a multivitamin and multivitamins are nutrients, which is very different than herbs. Your butt, your, your cells can only use so many nutrients at a certain time. Um, and we get most of our nutrients if we're eating a good diet, but people are sold on taking a multivitamin, even though there's not a whole lot of, a lot of evidence that it does very much. But here, I mean, you know, looking at this book, there's so much evidence of why we should all be taking an herb every single day. Um, this complex phytochemistry that we get from plants that is so protective of our cellular functions used to be in our food when we were eating a forage food diet hundreds of thousands, for, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. And we did that for hundreds of thousands of years. And that forage food diet was made mostly wild plants, stems and leaves and roots. 
and we were getting all this protective phytochemistry, you know, and that's where a lot of our herbs are actually come from. We've been consuming them. So when we started farming and gravitated toward eating grains and beans and meat, we started giving that up. But people recognized the importance, so we kept the herbs, we kept those plants as our culinary and medicinal herbs. And now, yeah, we'd use a spattering of spices and culinary herbs, but we're just not getting the concentrations. And it, even if you eat vegetables, it's not in your food. So that in itself is a pretty good case of why we should be supplementing with these herbs, because we're, it, it's something missing. I mean, if I had to define the thing that was missing most in, in, in our modern diet, it's this complex phytochemistry that, that comes from the herbs, uh, the, the, from plants that's so protective. So, yeah, I, I think it, it, it does make sense, but there's so much scientific literature that has proven it, 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 you know, it plays a huge role in reducing cancer, reducing chronic illness. Uh, there, there's just too much evidence out there to ignore. Um, but the question is, well, which herbs? So you, you don't want to take drug herbs that have drug-like effects. So there are some, like St. John's wort or things that we use that might uh, provide sedation to help us get over stress. You know, there are a lot of great herbs like that, but we want herbs that basically just balance us and protect our cells and make us more resilient. So I have my own list, um, you know, but there are a lot of herbs that you could use outside of this. So one of my herbs is uh, rhodiola that I take on a daily basis. So rhodiola is an herb from Siberia. It's one of the original adaptogens. An adaptogen is an herb that helps us become more resilient to stress. So it helps us. So, so you think about the environment. It's in a cold, harsh environment. So rhodiola helps us adapt to physical and mental stresses. It just makes us more resilient. Um, it protects our heart. It protects our tissues. It increases oxygenation of tissues. Um, and, uh, you know, so it protects all of our organs and all of our cells. Um, interestingly, um, to find different herbs in different places that are really similar. So a close relative grows naturally in the Appalachians of North America. So you find, so wherever you are, there are herbs all around you, but, um, but a lot of them have similar properties. So second on my list is not actually a plant. So we lump our medicinal mushrooms in with herbs too, even though there are plants because they have similar properties. So reishi mushrooms, if you've ever been walking in the woods and seen a, a mushroom growing on the side of the tree that looked like a fan that with, with kind of a rust colored rainbow color, that's a reishi. And the, uh, the Asian uh, version of, uh, of reishi has been found uh, to have some of those potent anti-cancer property knows, known. Um, it is also adaptogen. It helps balance uh, uh, physical stress and mental stress. It protects our organs, our heart, has some great antiviral properties. It's immune modulator. It balances our immune system, which is really important. Um, turmeric, everybody knows that one. That's the yellow color and curries from India. Um, in India, uh, every person gets about a gram of turmeric every day, and it's felt to be one of the reasons why they have such a low rate of Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, it's also great anti-inflammatory for joints. And all of the er these herbs have some mild antimicrobial properties, which is really important for keeping that internal tissue microbiome in balanced. Um, go to cola, another one from India, is very good for protecting our brain. It has some anti-diabetic effects, which are really nice that everybody needs. So does rhodiola. Um, milk thistle, we want to protect our livers. So in this toxic world, our liver takes a real beating. And as we go through time, our liver cells get replaced with fat cells. So we became, become less able to process toxins. 
And that's one of the reasons, too, why our cholesterol goes up is because our liver is important for managing cholesterol and processing cholesterol. So as you lose liver cells, that's one of the reasons why that cholesterol cleat keeps climbing. Um, so I've been taking milk thistle for 15 years. It has actually been shown to encourage or stimulate regeneration of liver cells. And that, um, so my cholesterol is actually better than when I was in my forties. And I think that's probably because I've been taking milk thistle for all these years. Um, so that's just a handful of some of the herbs that I think are really important. I, I, I uh, gave a, a summary in the book that really helps people make those choices of, you know, how do I, where do I get started? How do I adapt just a, a, a basic regimen of herbs? Yes. And I love how in the book you go by condition as well so that people, if they're struggling with a particular problem or a condition, they can kind of look and see what the recommendations and on the back, there's a really good table that kind of puts everything uh, into perspective and the different properties. And also some that are, you have to be more cautious about because there are some herbs that you mentioned before, they could also be potentially harmful, correct? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I try to put it in perspective, considering looking at, well, how does somebody get started with this that really has never taken herbs before? Because I remember the day, I mean, I would walk into a health food store and look at the shelves and just be completely overwhelmed. And now I go into a health food store and look at the products and go, oh, some of these products aren't so good and they're just not having the concentrations of the things that we need. So it's um, so it is really important to get good quality herbs, good quality concentrations and and the combinations that you need are really important, too. So that's one of the things that we really try to help with in the book is give guidelines of, of where how people should make those important choices. Now, I know that when it comes to women, pregnant women and lactating women um, might also run into some issues with herbs. How can they determine if there's some that are safe for them or potentially unsafe? Um, yeah, there are good sources and uh, there's a little bit of information about it in the book. Um, fortunately, fortunately, most of the herbs that I call everyday herbs, choices that you would make that don't have drug-like effects that are mainly protective, are things that people can take in pregnancy and really without any kind of concern or with lactation. In fact, they might, but they'd probably be a little better off with these herbs. Um, so, so fortunately, there there are an awful lot of herbs out there that you can take on a daily basis that really have a low level of concern. But um, getting on the internet and doing a search with try to find more of an herbal source, though. If you get on WebMD, these uh, and, and other things that pop up on Google as your first choices, these are all companies owned by pharmaceutical companies, and they're basically going to tell you, don't take that herb, go see your doctor. So yeah, uh, dig a little deeper, uh, either get an herbal reference book or dig a little deeper and find a company that is, or a source that is actually representing the herbs and not the pharmaceutical companies. And then going along those same lines, what about children? Uh, children tolerate these herbs quite well. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, the, these things are designed to promote wellness, promote life. And it's, it's true that it's going to do that in any age. And again, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's starting with that core of, of really safe herbs that don't have a high potential to cause problems in really any individual. And then, you know, working out and, and, and experimenting and learning about other herbs. But, um, you know, if, if you just start with uh, uh, a dozen or a couple of dozen herbs, you can go a long way with protecting your health for your whole life. Yeah, it's a good habit too. I yeah. did get a question from a listener about herbal teas 
And I know it's a little bit different because there's a huge market for tea and all different kinds of teas, but they wanted to know, are herbal teas safe for children? And what should people know before consuming herbal teas regularly? Yeah, um, herbal teas are great. Um, and you know most of the things that are on the market are going to be qualified as a food and the potential for actually harming children would be very, very, very low for, for most any of the products out there. Um, I think herbal teas are great. Um, you, it is a way to consume this really pro important protective phytochemistry. Um, the, the, the problem is concentration and consistency. Yeah, you, most people aren't going to do it consistently every day. And the teas, you're getting the aqueous chemicals, not necessarily the full spectrum of chemical from the plant. So it's beneficial. I think it's great, but you're not going to get as much as from a tea as you are a tincture or a commercial preparation of the herb. Um, so there's nothing wrong with doing both. Um, it's hard to get too much of this important phytochemistry. Haven't there been some concerns about heavy metal contamination for some teas? And is there a way that we can ensure that we're purchasing something that's safer? Yeah, I, you know, the, I, I think you're going to get a little better uh, possibility of, of not getting the, those things to a really high quality herbal preparation product than possibly even the teas. And the problem with the teas is they're not held to the same standards that somebody producing products would be. Um, but quite frankly, we're getting heavy metals in everything. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll ask you, I'll put you on the spot. Where are the heavy metals coming from? The earth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so why are humans today getting all these heavy metals that maybe humans didn't used to get? Probably because it's just getting concentrated in the food supply is what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's coal. It's because we're burning coal. Huh. When you think about coal, the plant, that's plant matter that's been compressed in the earth for millions of years under high pressure. And what happens, what has happened with coal is heavy metals from inside the earth get compacted in with the plant matter. So coal has cadmium, lead, mercury, all these heavy metals in it. So when we burn coal to produce energy, the smoke precipitates out heavy metals that normally, I mean, there, you know, we've been burning coal for about 3,000 years. It started in China about 3,000 years ago, but nothing like we've been burning it the past couple of hundred years. So all of these heavy metals were inside the earth. They really, life wasn't exposed to these things. So now burning coal, we're pulling this out of the earth along with a lot of other things that we're mining. We're bringing these things that are potentially toxic to life to the surface and spreading them all around. With, with coal, we're doing it in the smoke. So the smoke comes out, it precipitates, it, you know, it, it comes down with rain, it precipitates in streams and, and on the ground and, and all the plants. So everything is getting it and that concentrates up the food chain. So the bigger you are, the higher the concentration of mercury. That's why you're having, you know, you find mercury out in big fish out in the ocean. It's concentrating up in the, in the food chain. But it actually started out on the land in the streams with the really small microscopic creatures and then gradually moved its way up. And, and, but, but yeah, that's where it's coming from. So um, moving away from coal for a lot of reasons is a good idea. Uh, protecting yourself, just you know, trying to, to look for clean food, clean water every way you can. But it's out there. We're getting all this stuff. Yeah. Wow. That is fascinating. I had never thought of that before. But basically what you're saying is we're liberating the heavy metals inside our earth Correct. through burning coal gets into and, the and, air, it precipitates yeah. down in the rain and everything, and then we just end up eating it in our food because it gets absorbed back into the food, concentrated up the food chain. 
Yeah, I didn't even think about from. coal. That's not something I think about on a daily basis. So <laughs> thank not, you for bringing it? that up. Yeah. Okay, so I am super into fa uh, intermittent fasting and time restricted eating right now because it's uh, had some great effects on my health, something that I've been playing around with for the past three months. And I know that you mentioned it earlier in the episode and you also talk about it in your book. So do you integrate intermittent fasting or time restricted eating into your treatment plans often? Yeah, you know, and, and that doesn't have to be such that it's uncomfortable, you know? I mean, I remember this has been like, oh, 20 plus years ago, There, the, my kids were in a tennis club and, uh, there was this guy who was 93 who was out there still playing tennis. And it was like, and I said, you know, what, what's your secret? What's your secret? He looked at me and said, I only eat one meal a day. That's it. That's my, that's why I've lived so long. Yeah. Maybe that's part of it. You never know. But our body does need downtime to recover. Our cells need downtime. So, you know, when we're eating, we're processing nutrients and bringing in energy and all of that sort of thing. And we need that um, during a certain part of the day and we need it regularly. But the body, um, but if we're eating too much, we're just overwhelming our cells with uh, nutrients with carbohydrates with fats and they don't get you know it, it takes away their downtime um, uh, technically uh, you know fasting uh, promotes a process called autophagy which is important for two things autophagy is how cells basically prune worn out proteins mitochondria DNA and break down that stuff and 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 reuse it along with new replacement parts. So autophagy is really important, but autophagy is also how cells expel invasive microbes. So it's not just our immune system. Our cells can defend themselves using this process of autophagy. But if our cells are stressed and working too hard, they can't do that. So we need to give ourselves downtime. So taking that, that, narrow, that window and it doesn't, you know, it can be as long as eight hours or as short as six or even four hours. Um, personally, I like a little something to get started in my day when I get going in the morning. So I um, typically I'll have an egg and saute greens. I'll take just salad greens, big handful of salad greens and saute them with pesto or something like that. Really low carb very little carbohydrate or a smoothie like I mentioned this morning that I had this morning that was mostly vegetable and I'll have that just to kind of get me going but I won't eat anything until 12 or 1 o'clock and I eat most of my calories between 1 and 6 during the day um, and so my biggest meal is in the evening I kind of snack building up to that and then I eat this one meal and man if I do that consistently, you know, like when we go on vacation or we're around with other people and I, I don't do that, boy, do I notice a difference. Um, my energy goes down. But um, yeah, if you're doing that, if you're narrowing your eating window to about uh, six to eight hours, um, then I, I think there's some huge advantages in it and how you feel. Yeah. yeah. And I think any of these things, integrating the herbs, playing around with your eating window, I think all of that can be done on top of starting with optimizing just what you're eating, how much you're sleeping, reducing your stress and all of that. Because I think a lot of people look to some of these things, like we said earlier, as these magic cures or magic bullets, but then there's so many other things that they could optimize or work with first. So I think that's really important to know. Yeah. I wanted to go back to one of the things that is a you know a question I have about your approach and that's with the carbohydrates because my audience is primarily or mostly plant-based <clears throat> so when it comes to eating a whole food plant-based diet it's pretty high in carbohydrates. Yep. So I guess I'm curious about your thoughts on that. And, you know, I definitely agree that there can be harm 
to overconsumption of energy in general, um, this energy toxicity. So we don't want to be overeating, especially on a regular basis, because I think that that can affect health. But I, my opinions on carbohydrates differ a little bit. So I'd love to know what where your um, feelings of this um, carb, keeping a low carb diet, how is that helpful um, when it comes to health? Sure, yeah. I, you know, I think over the past 30 years, I've experimented with pretty much everything. And it's, um, you know, I, I grew up with a terrible GI tract because I was eating sugar, carb, you know, it was the dawning of the fast food age. And I was, you know, my family embraced it and I suffered from it. And then in the 80s, it was like, no, we don't need, want to eat that white flour. This whole grain stuff is great. So eat all the whole grains you want. And uh, you know, I was getting more and more, uh, having more issues with constipation. And my solution is, well, I just need to keep eating raisin bran and bran muffins until, and I just kept getting worse and worse and went through a phase that um, I, during, during that chronic illness phase where I didn't eat any gluten, I was very sensitive to it. But at the same time, I developed sensitivities to a lot of nuts and beans. 75% of the foods um, that I ate, I was sensitive to. So I couldn't do nuts, I couldn't do soy, I couldn't do a lot of different kinds of beans, which really made it difficult for me if I decided to go to being a strict vegetarian. Um, it just wasn't practical. So uh, over the years, you know, now the sensitivities are much better. I can eat some nuts and soy and things like that. Um, but I do, as far as a protein source for me, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's easier to eat meat. I just don't eat a lot of meat. And mostly the meat that I eat are, is uh, mostly poultry, eggs, uh, and fish. Um, but that golden rule, it I think is so important that I've had health for a long time is eat more vegetables than anything else. And I've met too many vegetarians that are in bad health that are, aren't eating vegetables, but they're eating grains and beans almost exclusively. And that can be really bad for your GI tract. We're just not designed to consume grains and beans at a high level. Um, so there are a lot of reasons for that. So yeah, it's kind of like I've been trying to get it down to, well, what are those qualifications that are so important for everybody? And eating more vegetables, whether you're you know, a meat eater, vegetarian, it doesn't matter. I think that's really important. Um, the carbohydrate, you look at the damage done out there, what people are mostly suffering from, and it's carbohydrate consumption. So I experimented with ketogenic uh, for a short period of time, and that's basically eating less than 75 grams of carbohydrate a day. And I found that I just felt terrible. And what it boils down to is glucose. What we get from starches and sugar is good for fast energy. If you want to think or, or make a sprint, you want to burn glucose, whereas Fat is really good for the slow burn, that long haul. So your brain really likes glucose. Your heart runs almost exclusively on fat. So different cells in your body use different energy sources depending on their job. So I think we do need a little bit of both, but looking at that, um, that ancient diet, it had carbohydrate in it, but it didn't have much because they weren't eating seeds or beans um, on, on a very high level. So they weren't getting very much carbohydrate. So I found if I bumped my carbohydrate up to about 150, 200 at the most, I felt well. Um, and it gave me more, more range in my diet. I mean, it's like I'll occasionally go out and eat a pizza pizza. Now, for, for that day, I'm pretty strict on how much carbohydrate that I eat, and I'll typically eat a big salad along with a piece of pizza. But I, uh, but I typically don't, um, you know, so, so, so I'm, I'm balancing it. Um, and I don't typically eat pizza every night, by the way. You know, I'm, I'm typically eating a blend, and I don't eat meat every day, but... I eat an enormous variety of foods within those parameters, 
And, you know, it's just, I, I love food more than I've ever, I enjoy food more than I ever have in my whole life. But eating a little bit of meat, a little bit of fish, eggs, just gives me a little bit more range that I'm comfortable with. Um, that's me. I think everybody has to find their individual path. But I do think cutting those carbohydrates down is really, really important because our cells just aren't designed to tolerate high carbohydrate load. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I definitely agree with your, you know, advice to eat vegetables more than anything, for sure. And that's why it's called Veggie Doctor Radio. Right. So yeah. definitely for that. And I think that the second principle um, that I would help people differentiate with is whole food versus processed food. Oh yeah. Because when we look at people's diets and we see carbohydrate, it's not coming from whole foods. People are not eating whole food forms of carbohydrates. They're not eating sweet potatoes and potatoes and brown rice. They're eating cakes, cookies, you know, those exactly. kinds of things, chips, which is a mix of the ultra processed grains and starches, but also the seed oils and fats and things like that that are made in a factory, which we know for sure are affecting our health. So Truly. I think starting with that whole foods and then emphasizing the vegetables and going from there, I think those are great principles. What do you wish more people knew? You know, this magic I found in herbs that I think so many people are missing out on, that they just don't wonder, realize this really wonderful thing that has such high potential to uh, promote resilience and wellness, and we're just ignoring it. And it's always been there, and we put it on a shelf years ago, and it needs to be taken back off the shelf, you know? Um, 20th century, we substituted drugs for herbs, and, it, you know, there's a place for drugs. There's a place for conventional medicine. Um, acute intervention, I think, is remarkably important. But, yeah, we shouldn't be discounting this other thing that is just such you know, a wonderful way to enrich your life. I love it. And I'm so glad that you're spreading the knowledge. It's very important. Do you have a morning routine? And if so, can you share it with us? Um, yeah, most of the time I, uh, I'm up and out the door walking the dog. Uh, my dog uh, helps me get that three miles a day minimum. Generally, I do, I, I do a lot of other things. I mean, you know, here at 65, I'm fortunate enough to still be kite surfing and a lot of things that I really enjoy that are pretty high intensity. Um, but, um, yeah, my dog and I, and usually my wife, we're, we're out there at least a mile or two first thing in the morning and then either a smoothie or an egg with some greens. And often that, um, you know, after that, my morning is when I am at my peak as far as brain power and writing. And, you know, so I do a lot of, uh, creative work and, trying to help people understand all of these concepts and principles. So I'm constantly, I, I spend about three or four hours during every morning just writing and working and, and trying to think through these things. But, you know, I have to get it started with some physical activity and just, a, you know, a little bit of food there. That's awesome. And yeah, and you're also exposing, exposing your retina to sunlight, which is helping to keep that circadian rhythm nice and strong and regular so that you sleep better at night. So it goes really? into all of those places of lifestyle medicine. Well, Dr. Rawls, this has been fantastic. Like I said, I'm so grateful that you went on this journey, even though it had to start in a place of pain and suffering, but I, I'm glad that you were able to recover yourself and get to a place where you're feeling amazing and healthy and, and have so much vitality and that you have taken this time to share this knowledge with us. Where can listeners connect with you and tell us about the products and services that you offer? All right. Well, it's... Um... I, I'm not actually practicing medicine. I find that I can reach more people through 
uh, uh, working with health coaches and writing and producing content. I am medical director at our uh, supplement company, Vital Plan, um, that uh, my daughter and I founded together. Uh, it's been almost 10 years um, and it's, it's grown a lot over the past five years. Um, our goal is to make herbs easy for people and, and give them a pathway to uh, incorporate herbs in their life and give them guidelines for other kinds of ways to enhance wellness. So not just selling specific herbal products, more selling a pathway of, in, of bringing herbs into your life and making them part of your life. Um, I'm really particular about the quality of the product. So we put a lot of time into testing and just bringing the highest quality, highest concentration product to the market. So people can really be comfortable that it isn't going to do things that might uh, work against them in any way. Um, so that is vitalplan.com. Uh, you can find my book, Cellular Wellness Solution, there. You can also find it on Amazon, of course. And it has a separate website that we're still building out called that you can find at cellularwellness.com. But the main website is vitalplan.com. Great. And I really do recommend the book. I think it's a good book to have on your bookshelf because it's almost like an encyclopedia, you. you know? So if you're having different conditions or ailments, you can kind of go through it. But it's definitely worth reading and learning that information. Okay, Dr. Rawls, last question. Leave us with your number one tip for people who are struggling with low energy or chronic illness and want to improve their health and well-being. Where should they start? Um, well, that's kind of our specialty with our company. It's, um, you know, it, when if you have low energy or struggling with any kind of chronic illness, it means your cells are suffering, right? So low energy, all the cells in your body are stressed and they are not able to do their job. So that can stress in different ways. So they're different chronic illnesses, but it's all about reducing the factors that are promoting the cellular stress. That's diet and lifestyle, but the herbs go a long way with that. So we actually have a package of supplements that's a little bit more robust than what someone would take on a daily basis that's more oriented toward recovery uh, called the Restore Kit. And it has a lot of support that goes along with taking those supplements just to guide people. But it's really applicable to any situation that people are struggling with what you just mentioned. Awesome. Well, Dr. Ross, thank you again for everything that you do and all the work that you're doing to help other people. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was wonderful. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.